prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you that we're being kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready for that wonderful day when we will see you face to face. Help us to live in a way that honours your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
let's pray again. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We praise and thank you this morning for our salvation and the promise of eternity with you. We bring before you this morning our family and friends and those we cannot see because of the new lockdown. Sustain us through this difficult time. Keep us physically, mentally and spiritually strong in you. We pray for those we know who have COVID and ask that they will recover quickly. We pray for those who are mourning because of the death of a loved one. We pray again for the people working in health and social care and others who have key worker roles. We pray for those who have to work from home and are finding that difficult. We pray for the vulnerable and the elderly. We pray for the children and young people in schools, colleges and universities. We pray for those who have been furloughed and those who are now without work. We also pray for those who are rejoicing as they welcome new babies into their families. As we spend more time at home, we ask for your continued protection and provision and help us to support one another as best we can under the current restrictions. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. Now we're going to have our talk for this morning by Tom Ward. Well, good morning. It's lovely to be with you and to have an opportunity to share with you through the, the wonders of the internet. Uh, it is a disappointment to me that I wasn't able to, to be with you in person. I very much enjoyed my visit when I last came to Breck. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the fellowship uh, and uh, time with uh, Stephen and Delphine and obviously meeting so many of you as well. Uh, so I do hope in the future to have an opportunity to be able to, to see you again. And I do pray uh, that God will be with you and bless you at this time. It's a, a difficult season for many. And I'm sure that you'll join with me in praying that God's kingdom will come and his will will be done in our lives. And also, as many in our society are contemplating life and uh, the fragility uh, of our lives, that, that many would turn to Christ. And um, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? That, that good could come out of such a, a difficult situation. Stephen had asked me to speak at your remembrance of, uh, service months ago, uh, a long time ago. And I had hoped that, that COVID-19 and its effects would be largely out of the way. And so I'd be able to, to come down to Chelmsford, but it, it hasn't happened. We've just entered into um, the, uh, a full national lockdown, take two. And uh, so, yeah, it wasn't possible, but uh, I hope that what I say today will still be of, of use uh, and profitable for you. It's also a privilege to be able to share on such an important day in, our, in the church calendar. I grew up in a church that really didn't give Remembrance Sunday much attention at all. Sometimes we'd do the two minutes note uh, silence. Sometimes we wouldn't even do that. So it's interesting when I joined uh, the Church of England church that I go to currently, it was a whole different ball game. We have a full service every year on Remembrance Sunday. We have a trumpet before the two minute silence, a trumpet afterwards. We sing the national anthem. There is a wreath that is laid at the front of church. And yeah, there's just a, a lot. Uh, and I think it's it's good. It's a good thing to remind ourselves because we we are forgetful people. And unless we have a specific time in the year to, to remind us, you know what, we have freedoms today that were bought at quite a cost. Uh, many people from our nation laid down their lives, were willing to die for a cause that was much greater than themselves. And so we have profited from, from their sacrifice and it is right to thank God for them and to reflect on it. Just uh, yesterday, I was walking home and I bumped into one of my neighbours. I've known him for about 20 years now. And he has had quite a hard life. He's struggled with alcoholism and um, isn't currently drinking at the moment, but he's just struggling with just meaningless. And he, no, so he just said, you know, I, 
Uh, I get up sometimes at three o'clock in the afternoon. I've just got nothing to get up for. And then he said this. He said, you know what? I've got nothing to live for. Absolutely nothing. And I've told him many times that I believe the, the meaning and purpose of life is found in Jesus Christ. But it did strike me as he said that because I was thinking about what I was going to say to you today. I was thinking about how so many people who went to war had a lot to live for. They had families. They had uh, homes and jobs and you know, many things that they enjoyed in life and they were willing to put those things on hold and risk it all for a greater cause. And obviously many of them were injured and very many people uh, ultimately died. And it just struck me that how grateful we should be for those who were willing to do that. And every Remembrance Sunday, as we remember those who, who um, laid down their life for our freedom, it also points to the greater sacrifice of Jesus Christ who laid down his life for all people who died for the sins of the world and I'd love to just reflect for a few minutes on that today by looking at Ephesians uh, sorry Philippians chapter 2 a wonderful passage so let me pray I'll read our passage uh, Philippians 2 verses 1 to 11 and then we'll uh, I'll share a few thoughts thank you father for this time Lord uh, I pray that you would use what I say today uh, to encourage and challenge uh, the believers at Breck. And um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Please use me for your glory. In Jesus name. Amen. So I'm going to read from Philippians 2. If you have a Bible, do please read along. If you haven't, that's absolutely fine. I'll read all the verses anyway. This is Philippians 2 verses 1 to 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearances as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is God's word. And what a, an amazing passage. Many commentators have called this the high point of the New Testament. It kind of is, a, is, a, is an amazing summation of what Christ came to do. We see his incarnation, we see his crucifixion, and we see his exaltation in these few verses. And that's what I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, talking to you about today. So let's begin with the incarnation that is spoken of in verse six and seven. Let, remi let me remind you of those verses. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So the Son of God lays down the riches and the glory and the majesty of heaven to the, the kind of the squalor and the very undignified uh, birth of being born in a an inn somewhere in Bethlehem amongst animals and laid in a, an animal trough quite different isn't it to think how far uh, the son of god comes from heaven down to earth there is uh, a very undignified and not a very kingly um, entrance into uh, into human life but it also he is born into the limitations of human flesh he has gone from needing nothing to being completely reliant on mary and joseph um, 
there was a, a song, uh, I don't know if you know it, it was a big hit in the 90s. It was called From a Distance. It was covered by Bette Midler and Cliff Richard and uh, Nancy Griffith. And there's a line in that song that goes like this. God is watching us from a distance. Now that is a deeply profound and theological line in a pop song. And it seemed to really strike a chord with people. It's been quoted in greeting cards and it was played at the opening ceremony of the 1996 uh, Olympic Games in Atlanta. Uh, you know, it seemed like that idea of God watching us from a distance seemed to strike a chord with people. It went unchallenged. But I believe it is deeply, deeply wrong. I believe it is not true. The Bible tells us the story of God being involved in the creation that he made. But maybe the climax of that involvement comes in the incarnation of the Son of God, where, where God takes on flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. God is not from a distance. God loves to presence himself with his people and he does that in such a beautiful way through the incarnation of Jesus. And you see that it's said there that he came to be a servant. Verse 7, by taking the very nature of a servant. Now the, the, the Greek word there for servant is the word doulos and maybe a, a, a more literal translation would be the word slave. Now, that's often kept out of Bible translations because of the connotations uh, of slavery today. I understand that, but it is a very strong word. Jesus not only laid down the glory of heaven to be with us, but also took on the limitations of human flesh, but also came to be with us, not to, to be served, not to walk around as a, a, a royal king with, with all the kind of the pomp and the ceremony that you would expect to go along with that. He came to serve, he came to be a slave for others. In this, uh, we see such selflessness from Christ laying down the riches of heaven to be with us, to face what we face, which means that no one can say today to Jesus, you don't know what I'm going through. That tends to be what we do when we're struggling, when we're facing hard times. You, you don't know what I'm going through. And Jesus says, I do. I can sympathise. I have been there. I have been in your shoes. The incarnation of Christ. And then we see in verse 8, the crucifixion. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So the Son of God has already laid down the glory of heaven to be with us. He then now is kind of descends even further to uh, to take our place on the cross, to uh, to lay down his life for all of us. So the sins that have been committed and will be committed, Jesus lives that perfect life and dies a sacrificial death in our place. This is a, a horrible death, a, a death of, of, of humiliation, where he would have been stripped naked and whipped and flogged. He was mocked. He was spat at. He was nailed to a cross and, and people just jeering at him. And then he is left to suffocate and die an agonising death. Just think how far he has come from the, the glory of heaven all the way to the point of humiliation of dying on a cross. We see here the humility of Christ in that. Do you see that in verse uh, second half of verse 8? He humbled himself, becoming obedient. So death in itself was, would have been kind of catastrophic enough for uh, the son of God, but even death on a cross, the worst kind of death that you could face. And he humbled himself. Now, that word today is seen as being fairly positive. If you're a humble person, people think that is uh, a good trait to have. But in the Greco-Roman world, it was it was seen as a weakness to be humble. You were meant to put yourself forward. You were meant to, to, to tell people how good you were. You didn't want to point out, uh, yeah, it's kind of... Um, uh, bring yourself low that wasn't good but that's what it means in the in the greek simply the word means to be brought low and most of the times it's used in the bible it's talked of people who are prideful who are then brought low by god but jesus isn't brought low 
he chooses himself to stoop down, to, to humble himself on a cross for us. So we see the incarnation, we see the crucifixion, and then we see the exaltation. Let me read verses 9 to 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So do you see the, the uh, trajectory that the, the Son of God has been on? He begins by uh, having the, the glory and the honour of heaven and he lays it down to come and be God with us. And then he goes to the cross and he descends even further into humiliation. And then after that, he is risen to new life and then is ascended in heaven. So often the exaltation of Christ is, is neglected. In his story. I'm not sure why. We spend a lot of time talking about him dying for our sins. We, we spend a little bit of time talking about the resurrection, but very little is spent on the, uh, the ascension and then his exaltation in heaven. Christ deserves all the honour and the glory and the praise for laying down his life. He did nothing wrong, the perfect life, a sacrificial death in our place, and he deserves to be honoured and glorified. And, and one day every knee will bow. I hope that you are someone that is bowing the knee today, that you will not go to the judgment and then be forced to your knee uh, in recognising who Jesus is. We recognise today that he is worthy of honour and praise and glory. Now, here's the interesting thing. The whole kind of context of Philippians is the Apostle Paul telling us how we are meant to live a uh, uh, it tells us how we are to live. It's, it's an example. It's like, you know, read my letter and do what I call you to do. You to be like Christ and do what he does. So it's rather strange that in this chapter, Paul gives us three examples of things that Christ did that we cannot do. We're meant to follow the example of Christ, but here we can't be incarnated like he was incarnated. We are not God. We cannot take on a new nature. We can't go to the cross to, to pay for the sins of the world because we are not guiltless. We are guilty. We have fallen short of the standard set by us in the Bible. We've fallen every single day of our lives. So we cannot go to the cross either. And so because of that, we are not going to be exalted in the way that Christ is. We're not going to, uh, we're not going to be worshipped and, and glorified in heaven for living a perfect life and dying a sacrificial death. So what is going on? Why would Paul say, be like Christ, but then give us examples of things that we can't do? Well, look with me, if you will, to verse five. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Do you see what he's saying there? What he says is, in your life, you should be like Christ. Set your mind to be like Christ. Approach things in your life like Christ did, even if you're not going to do the things that he did. There are many things that Jesus did that we were called to do. Just read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and you will see countless examples of how we are to do exactly what Jesus did. But in these three things, we are not to do them, but we are to approach them in the way that Christ approached them. So look with me then again at verse 3. Verse 3 and listen out for how Christ approached uh, the incarnation and the crucifixion. Verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests but each of you to the interests of others. So do you see now, if we, we tie these two things together, we tie the examples that we find in Christ to our own behaviour. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Be selfless. And that is what Jesus did in his incarnation. He laid down the glories of heaven to be with us, God with us. Rather in humility, value others above yourself. Jesus humbled himself humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. So there is uh, much here for us to reflect on in terms of what we can't do, 
in Jesus' life, there's also much that we can reflect on in terms of what we can do. We are called to be selfless people. We are called to be humble people. I wonder if you reflect for a second on what is the most, what's the most selfless thing that you've ever done before? I was thinking about this the other day and I thought of an example when I was a teenager, I had a paper round and it was a sweet deal. I would go out and it took me about 20 minutes, uh, Monday to Friday, I would go out, I'd get back from school, cycle down to the corner shop, get my papers, I had about 30 papers to deliver and it was basically on two streets. And so I'd work my way back up the two streets and it would take me 20 minutes, I'd be done. Bish bash bosh, no problem. Um, and then my little brother decided that he wanted to have a paper round as well. So I took him down uh, to the shop and he was offered a round a few weeks later. Anyway, his round took a lot longer, whereas mine took 20 minutes. Uh, when he first went out, it took him about two and a half hours. He managed to, to whittle it down to taking about an hour and 15 minutes. So I remember because he was three years, two years younger than me. I said, look, I'm, I'm going to take that paper round and you can have mine. I swapped what was a sweet deal for me. It was the same amount of newspapers, but basically the, the paper round that my brother had seemed to cover most of the Northwest. It was ridiculous. But anyway, I chose to do that. And for the next four years, I did the larger paper round to help out my little brother. Now, that stands out to me in my teenage years because that wasn't normally the way that I acted towards my brother uh, and no, not the way I often can act even today. I can be so selfish. I can only want what I want and, and my desires, my needs, just thinking of me. And I think in this season of lockdown, uh, it's made that easier for all of us to not look to others, to not help out other people, to not consider others better than ourselves. It's so easy to become isolated and internally focused. And I believe the call in this passage today is for us to, to recognise that and ask for God's help for us to be selfless. And what about humility? Are you someone who is humble? You, you, you are not prideful, you're not puffed up, but you recognise your need for God's help and the help of other people. Let's be selfless people and let's be humble people. Particularly as we respond, as we reflect today on all those who laid down their lives for us, they were selfless. They uh, had a, a, a greater uh, cause to, uh, than their own personal safety and security, and they were willing to pay the ultimate price by, by de uh, dying in battle so that we can be free today. But how much more are we made free by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, free to be a slave of him, to, to be a servant of Christ, to live for him every day of our lives. So let's learn the lessons of Philippians 2. There are things that Christ did that we can't do. And most of us, if not all of us, won't be called upon to, to have to go to battle like all those soldiers did of old. But we can still live self of selfless lives. We can still live humble lives to the glory of Jesus Christ, who is ruling and reigning in heaven today. He is exalted. Let me pray. Father, so th thankful for this opportunity to be able to share. Lord, we are so grateful for the men and women who, um, who went to war, who uh, served their country in such valiant ways, and so many of them paying with their lives. Lord, we are grateful for their sacrifice and we remember them today. We honour them today. But even more so, Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, who paid the ultimate sacrifice for us so that we would be free. I pray that we'd never forget that and help us to live lives of humility and selflessness as we model Jesus Christ in our lives. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for being with me. It was a real privilege. And as I say, I hope I'll be able to join you in person in the future. But for now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Um, an act of remembrance now for Remembrance Sunday. Our red poppy is a symbol of both remembrance and hope for a peaceful future. 
Hoppies are worn as a show of support for the armed force community. And I'm sure you know that the hobby now is well known and a well established symbol, one that carries a wealth of history and meaning with it. Wearing a poppy is still very, a very personal choice, reflecting individual experiences and personal memories. It's never compulsory, but it's greatly appreciated by those who it is intended to support. But what is the inspiration and history behind the poppy becoming a symbol of remembrance? Well, during World War I, much of the fighting, as you probably know, took place in Western Europe. The countryside was blasted, bombed and fought over repeatedly. Previously beautiful landscapes turned to mud. Bleak and barren scenes were little, when little or nothing could grow. There was one notable and striking exception in the bleakness, the bright red Flanders poppies. These resilient flowers flourished in the middle of so much chaos and destruction growing in thousands upon thousands. In the spring of 1915, shortly after losing a friend in Ypres, a Canadian doctor, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, was moved by the sight of these poppies, and that inspiration led him to write the now famous poem in Flanders Fields. I'm going to read that to you now. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row. That mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard among the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. That poem then inspired an American academic named Moina Michael to adopt the poppy in memory of those who had fallen in the war. She campaigned to get it adopted as an official symbol of remembrance across the United States and worked with others who were trying to do the same in Canada, Australia and the UK. Also involved in those efforts was a French woman who was in the UK in 1921 where she planned to sell the poppies in London. There she met Earl Haig, founder of the Royal British Legion, who was persuaded to adopt the poppy as an emblem for the Legion in the UK. The Legion, who was formed in 1921, ordered 9 million poppies and sold them on the 11th of November that year. The poppies sold out immediately. The first poppy appeal raised over £106,000 to help veterans with housing and jobs considerable sum of money at that time. Today about 40,000 volunteers distribute 40 million copies. In every act of remembrance we honour the memory of the fallen and pledge to care for the living. We will remember them. We'll now have a two minute silence.
when you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. Now we're going to sing or listen to Lord for the Years. prayer. May you experience the Lord's continuing presence and peace in these demanding days. And may he hasten the day when we shall once again meet together to the praise of his glory and grace. Amen. Thank you so much for um, listening today and viewing this service. And I pray that God will bless you in the coming week. And we're just going to end this morning with that um, great song. Yeah, a great song of praise. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Thank you. Bye. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I'm
Liberation